Chapter 3. World Literary Space There is one thing of which one can say neither that is one meter long, nor that it is not one meter long, and that it is the standard meter in Paris. But this is, of course, not to ascribe any extraordinary property to it, but only to mark its peculiar role in the language game of measuring with a meter rule. Ludwig Wittgenstein, Philosophical Investigations as people of the fringes, inhabitants of the suburbs of history, we Latin Americans are uninvited guests who have sneaked in through the west back door. Intruders who have arrived at the Feast of Modernity as the lights are about to be put out. We arrived late everywhere. We were born when it was already late in history. We have no past, or if we have one, we spit on its remains. Octavia Paz, The Labyrinth of Solitude. The hierarchical structure that orders the literary world is the direct product of the history of literature in the sense I have described, but it is also what makes the his this history. Indeed, one is tempted to say that literary history is incarnated in the structure of the world of letters, which supplies its motive force, that the events of the literary world take on meaning through the structure that produces them and gives them form, and in doing so, makes literature at once stake, resource, and belief. In the World Republic of Letters, the richest spaces are also the oldest, which is to say, the ones that were the first to enter into literary competition, and whose national classics came also to be regarded as universal classics. The literary map that has taken shape in Europe since the 16th century cannot be regarded, then, simply as the result of gradual extension of literary belief or the idea of literature, in keeping with the familiar image of the dissemination, fortune, or even influence of a literary form or work. It is a consequence of the unequal structure, to recall Fernand's Braudel's phrase once again, of literary space, the uneven distribution of resources among national literary spaces, in measuring themselves against one another. These spaces slowly establish hierarchies and relations of dependency that over time create a complex and durable design. So the past always counts, as Braudel rightly insisted. The inequality of the world is the result of structural realities that are at once slow to take shape and slow to fade away. An economy, society, civilization, or political complex finds it very hard to live down a dependent past. One. Fernand Braudel Civilization Capitalism, 15th to 18th Century, Volume 3, The Perspective of the World, translated C.N. Reynolds, Berkeley University of California Press, 1919. So, too, the structure of the literary world lastingly perpetuates itself despite the various transformations it appears to undergo, particularly in its political aspect. The world of letters is a relatively unified space characterized by the opposition between the great national literary spaces, which are also the oldest and accordingly the best endowed, and those literary spaces that have more recently appeared and that are poor by comparison. Henry James, who chose English nationality as though it were a matter almost of literary salvation, who made the gap between the American and European worlds the subject of a great part of his work, and who in his own practice of literature had direct experience of the literary destitution of America at the end of the 19th century, lucidly described art as a flower that can flourish only in a thick soil. It takes a great deal of history, as James once remarked, to produce a little bit of literature. But it is not sufficient to imagine a simple binary opposition between dominant and dominated literary spaces. One would do better to speak of a continuum, for the many forms of antagonism to which domination gives rise prevent a linear hierarchy from establishing itself. Obviously, not all those who are literally dominated find themselves in the same situation. Their common conditions of dependency does not imply that they can be described in terms of the same categories. Each one is dependent in a specific way. Even within the most richly endowed region of literary space, which is to say in Europe, which was the first to enter into transnational competition, one finds newer literatures that are dominated by older ones. This is notably the case in nations that long remain subject to external political control, as in Central and Eastern Europe, or to colonial domination, as in the case of Ireland. It is necessary also to include in this group, which may be thought of as a subset of outlying areas within a larger central space, all those countries that were dominated, not politically, but literally, through language and culture, such as Belgium, French-speaking and German-speaking Switzerland, Austria, and so on.
These dominated areas within Europe were the cradle of the great literary revolutions. As heirs by language and shared culture to the richest traditions in the world of liter letters, already by the time the first nationalist claims began to be asserted in the 19th century, they had accumulated sufficient assets of their own to cause upheavals that were registered in the centers, upsetting the old hierarchies of the established literary order. Thus, between. Thus, between 1890 and 1930, in a literally destitute country under colonial rule, there occurred one of the greatest literary revolutions, the Irish Miracle. Marked by the appearance of three or four of the most important writers of the 20th century, the case of Franz Kafka illustrates the same point. Although he belonged to an emerging Czech literary space and took an enthusiastic interest in the enigmatic and innovative bodies of work of the century, by virtue of the fact that he was heir to the whole of German language and culture, an heir who nonetheless sought to subvert his inheritance. Mm. The same logic applies to the formation and development of American literatures, the new states that emerged in the Americas at the end of the 18th and beginning of the 19th centuries do not lend themselves to interpretation in terms of the Herderian models, in part because decolonialization in these regions was achieved by Creoles, persons of European descent born in the Americas. Language was not an element that differentiated them from their respective imperial metropoles, as Benedict Anderson observes. There was never an, ice, an issue in those early struggles for national liberation. Two. Benedict Anderson, Imagined Communities, Reflections on the Origin and Spread of Nationalism, London, Versa, 1983. Nor were the Mark Farrell called colonist independence movements, which unfolded between 1760 and 1830 in the United States, the Spanish colonies, and Brazil, consequences of the revolution herder inaugurated. Three. See Mark Farrell. Histoire de colonisations de Coquet à Independence, 13th to 20th siècles. Paris, Seal, 1994, especially Chapter 7. They were the product instead of the spread of the French Enlightenment and relied on a critique of imperial ancien regime that ignored the whole notion of popular belief founded on nation, people, and language. Four. See Anderson, Imagine Communities, 50 to 65. Examining the distinctive characteristics of Latin American history, the Venezuelan writer and intellectual Arturo Uslar Us Us Pietri, 1906-2001, described the originality of America in relation to other colonized countries. Our case is different, original, he wrote, above all because the American continent has known, from the beginning and through language and religion, the most sensitive cultural fibers there are. An integration with of Western culture that the other areas of European expansion never knew. Latin America is a living and creative part of this whole region, the West, which is steeped in particularities, and why not call it the extreme West, since it possesses distinctive signs that no modern empire has engendered. 5. Arturo Uslar Piet, Insurgences and Visionaries de América Latin, translated Philippe de Sons, Letters, Paris Cartier, 1995 -78. Both North America and Latin America literatures are the for the direct descendants through the colonists who demanded independence from their home countries of European literatures, the freedom to build upon the literary heritage of England, Spain, and Portugal enabled them in the 20th century to trigger unprecedented literary upheavals, of which the works of Faulkner, Garcia Marquez, and Guillemariz Rosa are the three outstanding examples. By appropriating the literary and linguistic assets of the European countries, whose heritage they claimed, the writers of America succeeded in establishing a sort of transatlantic patrimony. My classics are those of my language, Octavio Paz unequivocally stated. I consider myself to be a descendant of Lope and Quevedo, as any Spanish writer would. Yet, I am not a Spaniard. I think that most writers of Spanish America would say the same, as would writers from the United States, Brazil, and Francophone. Canada with regard to the English, Portuguese, and French traditions. Six. Octavio Paz, in Search of the Present 1990 Noble Literature, Lecture, Bilingual Edition, Translated Anthony Stanton, San Diego, Hercourt, Brace, Javanovich, 1995, Translations, Larry Mack.
Roads to Freedom. The construction of national literary space is closely related, as we have seen, to the political space of the nation that it helps build in turn. But in the most endowed literary spaces, the age and volume of their capital, together with the prestige and international recognition these things imply combine to bring about the independence of literary space as a whole. The oldest literary fields are therefore the most autonomous as well, which is to say the most exclusively devoted to literature as an activity, having no need of justification beyond itself. The scale of their resources gives them the means to develop in opposition to the nation and its strictly political interests, a history and logic of their own that are irreducible to politics. Literary space translates political and national issues into its own terms, aesthetic, formal, narrative, poetic, and at once affirms and denies them. Though it is not altogether free from political domination, literature has its own ways and means of asserting a measure of independence of constituting itself as a distinct world in opposition to the na nation and nationalism, a world in which external concerns appear only in refracted form, transformed and reinterpreted in literary terms and with literary instruments. In the most autonomous countries, then, literature cannot be reduced to political interest or used to suit national purposes. It is in these countries that the independent laws of literature are invented and that the extraordinary and improbable construction of what may be proper may properly be referred to as the autonomous international space of literature is carried out. This very long process, through which autonomy is achieved and literary capital hoarded, 7. See the chapter titled La Coquette de l'Autonomie and Pierre Bourdieu, Les Regles de l'Art, Paris, CO, 1992, 75-164. It tends also to obscure the political origins of literature, and by causing the link between literature and nation to be forgotten, encourages a belief in the existence of a literature that is completely pure beyond the reach of time and history. Paradoxically, it is time itself that enables literature to free itself from history. But if still today, and even in those centuries that are the freest, literature remains the most conservative of the arts, which is to say, the one that is the most subject to traditional conventions and norms of representation, norms from which painters and sculptors, through the revolution of abstraction, were long ago liberated, this is because the denied link with the political nation, camouflaged by well-worn euphemisms, remains very powerful. Evidence of this may be found particularly in the role played by writers in debates over spelling reforms. The defense of the national language by the most conservative authors who regard it not only as a specific tool of their trade but also as an element of national property, that it is their duty to project reveals their political dependence. Their despite, this despite their claims to take part in these debates in the very name of literary specificity. Autonomy is nonetheless a fundamental aspect of world literature, world literary space. The most independent territories of the literary world are able to state their own law, to lay down the specific standards and principles applied by their internal hierarchies, and to evaluate works and pronounce judgments without regard for political and national divisions. Indeed, autonomy amounts to its own categorical imperative, enjoining writers everywhere to stand united against literary nationalism against the institution of politics into literary life. In other words, the structural internationalism of the most literary countries strengthens and guarantees their independence. Autonomy in the world of letters is always relative. In France, the volume of accumulated capital was so great and the literary domination exerted over the whole of Europe from the 18th century onward so uncontested, and indeed incontestable, that it became the most autonomous literary space of all which is to say the freest in relation to political and national institutions. The emancipation of literary activity in France for many, if not all, of the constraints of political life had one striking consequence. French literary space, having imposed itself as universal, was adopted as a model, not insofar as it was French, but insofar as it was autonomous, which is to say purely literary. In other words, French literary capital belonged not to France alone, but to all nations. Indeed, it is this very capacity for being universalized or denationalized that allows varying degrees of autonomy among literary spaces to be recognized. Valéry Larbaud, by virtue of his position as one of the most emin eminent figures in French liter 
responsible for introducing a great deal of wor world literature to Paris, was able to state what was to become the fundamental article of faith in the great literary centuries. Every French writer is international. He is a poet, a writer for all of Europe, and for a part of America as well. All that which is national is silly, archaic, disreputably patriotic. It served a purpose under certain circumstances, but that time has passed. There is now a country of Europe. Nine. Valérie Larbaud, Sous l'invocation de Saint-Germain, Paris, Galimard, 1946. It was through this very process of emancipation from national politics that Paris became the world capital of literature in the 19th century. Because France was the least national of literary nations, it was able to manufacture universal literature while consecrating works produced in outlying territories, impressing the stamp of literarité upon texts that came from far-flung lands, thereby denationalizing and departicularizing them declaring them to be acceptable as legal tender in the countries under its literary jurisdiction, thanks to its promotion of the law of universal, universality in the world of letters against the ordinary political laws of nations. France became an alternative model for writers from every part of the literary world who aspired to autonomy, the Greenwich Meridian of Literature. The unification of literary space through competition presumes the existence of a common standard for measuring time, an absolute point of reference and conditionally recognized by all contestants. It is at once a point in space, the center of all centers, which even literary rivals by the very fact that the competition are agreed and acknowledging, and a basis for measuring the time that is peculiar to literature. Events that leave a mark on the literary world have a tempo, to use Pierre Bourdieu's term, that is unique to this world and that is not, or it is not, or is not necessarily synchronous with the measure of historical, which is to say political time that is established as official and legitimate. 10. Pierre Bourdieu, Homo Academicus, Paris Editions de Minuit, 1984 226. Literary space creates a present on the basis of which all positions can be measured, a point in relation to which all other points can be located, just as the fictive line, known as the prime meridian, arbitrarily chosen for the determination of longitude, contributes to the real organization of the world and makes possible the measure of distances and location of positions on the surface of the earth. So what might be called the Greenwich Meridian of Literature makes it possible to estimate the relative aesthetic distance from the center of the world of letters of all those who belong to it. The, this aesthetic dis distance is also measured in temporal terms. Since the prime meridian determines the present of literary creation, which is to say modernity, the aesthetic distance of a work or corpus of works from the center may thus be measured by, the ter by their temporal remove from the canons that, at the precise moment of estimation, define the literary present. In this sense, one may say that a work is contemporary, that it is more or less current, as opposed to being out of date. Temporal metaphors abound in the language of criticism, depending on its proximity to the criteria of modernity, that it is modern or avant-garde, as opposed to being academic, which is to say based on outmoded models that belong to the literary past or otherwise fail to conform to the criteria that at any given moment determine the present. Gertrude Stein neatly summed up the question of the localization of modernity in a single phrase. Paris, she wrote in Paris, France, 1940, was where the 20th century was. 11. Gertrude Stein, Paris, France, New York, Charles Scribner's Sons, 1940, 11. As, as site of the literary present and capital of modernity, Paris, to some extent, owed its position to the fact that it was where fashion, the outstanding expression of modernity, was made. In the famous Paris Guide of 1867, Victor Hugo insisted on the authority of the City of Lights not only in political and intellectual matters, but also in the domain of taste and elegance, which was to say of fashion and everything modern. Defy I defy you, he declared, to wear another hat than the hat of Paris. The ribbon worn by the woman in the street in Paris rules. In every country, the way in which this ribbon is tied has the force of law. This law was part and parcel of what Hugo identified as the city's special authority. Paris, it needs to be emphasized, it is, is a government. 
This government has neither judges, nor police, nor soldiers, nor ambassadors. It operates through infiltration, which is to say, omnipotence. It falls drop by drop upon humanity and everywhere leaves its impression, apart from whoever officially exercises, exercises authority above or below, lower or higher. Paris exists and its way of existing rules, its books, its newspapers, its theater, its industry, its art, its science, its philosophy, the procedures associated with its science, the fashions that are part of its philosophy, its good and its bad, its good and its evil, all these things arouse the spirit of nations and lead them. Louis Zubakatetid, Paris Gay, Par le Prince de Gribon, the Artiste de la France, Paris, Avril Lacroix, 1867. The ability to decree without fear of challenge what is or is not fashionable in the domain of haute couture and elsewhere permitted Paris to control one of the main routes of access to modernity. Stein described the link between fashion and modernity in its own ironic, foul, naive way. And so in the beginning of the 20th century, when a new way had to be found naturally, they needed France. It was important, too, that Paris was where fashion were made. And so, quite naturally, Paris, which has always made fashions, was where everyone went in 1900. It is funny about art and literature. Fashions became part of it. Two years ago, everybody was saying that France was down and out, was sinking to be a second-rate power, etc., etc. And they said, but I do not think so, because not for years, not since the war, have hats been as various and lovely and as French... As they are now. I do not believe that when the characteristic art and literature of a country is active and fresh, I do not think that country is in its decline. So Paris was the place that suited those of us that were to create the 20th century art and literature, naturally enough. 13. Stein, Paris, France, 12. By combining all these structural elements, Paris managed to sustain its position at least until the 1960s as the center of the system of literary time. The temporal law of the world of letters may be stated thus. It is necessary to be old in order to have any chance of being modern, or of decreeing that it is modern. In other words, having a long national past is the condition of being able to claim a literary existence that is fully recognized in the present. That is what Du Bellay had in mind when he conceded, in the defense and illustration of the French language, that the handicap of French, French in the battle against Latin was what he called its lateness. At stake in the competition between literary centers, all of which by definition enjoy the privilege of antiquity, is mastery of just this measure of time and space, which is to say, the power to claim for oneself the legitimate present of literature and to canonize its great writers, among all the central spaces that contend with each one by virtue of the antiquity and nobility of their literature. It is the Greenwich Meridian, the source of literary time that stands as the capital of literature, the capital of capitals. The continually redefined present of literary life cons constitutes a universal artistic clock by which writers must regulate their work if they wish to attain legitimacy. If modernity is the sole present moment of literature, which is to say what makes it possible to institute a measure of time, the literary Greenwich Meridian makes it possible to evaluate it and recognize the quality of a work, or, to the contrary, to dismiss a work as an anachronism or to label it provincial. It needs to be emphasized that the relative notion of aesthetic backwardness and advance, which all writers have in the back of their minds, through the structure of the literary world, is never explicitly described in such terms, since one of the unwritten laws of the World Republic of Letters requires that literary talent and recognition be universal. I are not introduced here in order to lay down some fixed and immutable definition of literature. Nonetheless, the existence and influence of, the, of these notions needs to be acknowledged without any judgment being made as to their value or normative character, for they are part of the logic of temporal competition. Frederick II of Prussia, who, as we have seen, wished to bring his people into the European literary world at the end of the 18th century, proposed his own version of German backwardness together with the chronology of the formation of literary space. I am dismayed not to be able to lay out for you a more ample catalogue of our good productions. I do not accuse the nation, it lacks neither spirit nor genius, but it has been delayed by causes that have prevented it from growing up at the same time as its neighbors. It was therefore a question, considering the logic of literary competition, of making up for lost time in order to overcome its backwardness. We are ashamed, he wrote, that in certain genres we cannot equal our neighbors, and so we desire through timeless efforts to make up for the time that our calamities have caused us to lose. There can be little doubt that, taking note of such feelings, the muses will lead us in our turns into the temple of glory.
This curious delay was the source of what the Prussian king readily acknowledged to be a special form of poverty which implied the existence of a literary marketplace characterized by great inequalities. Let us, therefore, not imitate the poor who wish to pass for the rich. Let us acknowledge our destitution in good faith, that this may encourage us instead to obtain by our own efforts the treasures of literature, whose possession will raise national glory to its full height. 13. Frederick II of the Prussia, de la Literature Allemande, Paris, Calumar, 1984, 28, and what is modernity? Modernity's connection with fashion is a sign of its inherent instability. It is also inevitably an occasion of rivalry and competition because the modern, by definition, is always new and therefore open to challenge. The only way in literary space to be truly modern is to contest that the present as outmoded, to appeal to a still more present present as yet unknown, which thus becomes the newest certified present. The success of newcomers to literary space and time in breaking into the ranks of the established moderns and earning for themselves the right to take part in debates over the definition of the latest modernity, therefore depends to some extent on their familiarity with the most recent innovations in form and technique. The necessity of being up to date in order to obtain recognition explains why the concept of modernity is so frequently and so emphatically invoked by writers claiming to embody literary innovation, innovation from, its formulation, from its first formulation by Baudelaire. In the mid-19th century, to the very name of the review founded by Sartre, a hundred years later, Le Temps Moderne, one thinks of Rimbaud's famous injunction, one must be absolutely modern, also of the also of the Modernismo, founded by Ruben Dario at the end of the 19th century, the Brazilian modernist movement of the 1920s, and futures movements in Italy and in Russia. 15. See Jean Claude de Marcade, Alex Cruz, Jean-Amic, et Valmir Korbenikov, Le Mar Comte, and Leon, 1913, Le Forme Historique de l'Ouvre de l'Art et de Ville de la Première Guerre, Edited Lillian Brian Guerrier, 3 volume. Clancy, 1971, 1973, 1960. The rushing after lost time, the frantic quest for the present, the rage to be contemporaries of all mankind, as Octavio Paz put it, all these things are typical of the search for a way to enter literary time and thereby to attain artistic salvation. 16. Octavio Paz, The Labyrinth of Solitude, translated Lysander Kemp, New York, Grove, 1985-94. Danilo Keyes perfectly expressed the importance of this extraordinary belief in literary modernity. I still want to be modern, but I don't mean that because things are constantly changing, we need to keep up with them. I mean that there is something in the way a work is written and the times in which it is written that makes it part of its age. 17. Danilo Kiev, The Conscience of an Unknown Europe, in Homo Poeticus, edited Susan Sontag, translated Ralph Mannheim et al. New York, Farrer, Strauss, and Nikier, 1985-18. The modern work is condemned to become dated unless by achieving the status of a classic. It manages to free itself from the fluctuations of taste and critical opinion. We pass our time arguing over taste and colors, Valerie observed. It is the same as a stock exchange on countless juries and the academics and it cannot be otherwise 18. Paul Valerie La Liberty de l'Esprit in regards to Le Monde Actual in Ur edited Jean Hittier two volume Paris Bernard nineteen fifty seven eighteen sixty two literary literarily speaking a classic is a work that rises above competition and so escapes the bidding of time. Only in this way can a modern work be rescued from aging by being declared timeless and immortal. The classic carnates literary legitimacy itself, which is to say that it is recognized as constituting literature what, in serving as a unit of measure, supplies the basis for determining the limits of that which is considered to be literary. All writers from countries that are remote from literary capitals refer consciously or unconsciously to a measure of time that takes for granted the existence of a literary present. Determined by the highest critical authorities, the moment confers legitimacy on certain books by including them among those works judged to be contemporary. 
Thus, Octavia Pass, 1914-1998, and the passage from Labyrinth of Solitude that serves as an epigraph to this chapter, spoke of Latin America as inhabitants of the suburbs of history, intruders who have arrived at the Feast of Modernity as the lights are about to be put out, people who were born when it was already late in history, 19. Pass, the Labyrinth of Solitude, 2.18. In his 1990 Nobel Prize acceptance speech, significantly titled La Busqueda del, Present, del Presente, In Search of the Present, Paz described his discovery at a very young age of a curious dislocation of time and his subsequent quest, poetic, historical, and aesthetic for a present that his country's separation from Europe, a constant feature of our spiritual histories, had deprived him of contact with. I must have been about six. One of my cousins, who was a little older, showed me a North American magazine with a photograph of soldiers marching down a wide avenue, probably in New York. They've returned from the war, she said, but for me the war had taken place in another time, not here and now. I felt dislodged from the present. After that, time began to fracture more and more, and space to multiply. I felt that my world was disintegrating, that the real present was somewhere else. My time was a fictitious time. That was how my expulsion from the present began. For us Spanish Americans, this present was not in our own countries. It was the time lived by others, by the English, the French, the Germans. It was the time of New York, Paris, London, 20. Paz, in search of the present time, 14 through 16. What Paz recounts here is nothing other than his personal discovery of central time, which is to say his own discentering, his own sense of disadvantaging remoteness. The process of unification in art, no less than in politics, assumes a common measure of absolute time that suspends, supersedes other temporalities.